Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Clark Gray, and I'm a, a faculty fellow here at CPC. Um, I'm excited to introduce uh, Miyuki Hino, who is an assistant professor in the planning department, also here at UNC with a secondary teaching appointment in E3P. Um, she comes to us from Stanford, where she got a PhD in environment and resources. And uh, she's interested in, in exposure and vulnerability to flooding, as you're going to hear about shortly. Uh, she's been very successful. Uh, she's published in PNAS, Nature Climate Change, Nature Sustainability. Those are really the most high profile journals in, in this area, I would say. Um, and then just as a personal aside, I would also recall how uh, I saw a working paper of hers maybe three or four years ago, the, the paper on flooding in Virginia. And I thought it was really cool because no one was doing that kind of a thing. And then we got her application to a search committee I was on for E3P, which was also very exciting. And now we hear, we have her here at UNC and uh, we're all very happy for that. So um, welcome, uh, Miyuki. Thanks, Clark. Um... And thanks everyone for having me. I'm excited uh, to have the chance to share some of my work with you. And fortunately, sadly, we'll not be talking directly about some of the uh, coastal flooding work that I've been doing, though um, I'm obviously happy about happy to talk about that at the end. Um, and I'll just note too that uh, lots of the work um, that I'll be presenting today is very much in progress. And so I'd love um, feedback, advice, thoughts, um, on how to make things kind of more interesting, more powerful. All right, I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So uh, lots of my work is motivated by kind of the highly disruptive and damaging nature of floods and storms. And that you can measure in lots of different ways. Right here, I'm showing economic losses, um, but also human health, human safety, well being uh, more generally. And what you can see here so, this is data collected by Munich Re, one of the big global reinsurers, that we've had, had this really steady increase in uh, global losses from these particular extreme weather events um, over the past 30 to 40 years. Um, and there are particular spikes when uh, landfalling hurricanes hit the US. So one of those spikes is 2005, which was Hurricane Katrina. Um, and the most recent one on there is 2017, which was the year that Harvey, Irma, and Maria um, all uh, made landfall in North America. So one of the really interesting things that Munich Re does with this data is they report adjusted estimates to account for the fact that people and assets in these hazardous places have grown over time. And the idea here is that if a hurricane hits Miami today, compared to that exact same storm in 1980, there would be a lot more damage today because there's a lot more people, there's a lot more stuff to be damaged in Miami. So when you adjust all of these events for the changes in exposure and assets that have happened over that time period, you see a really different trend. You see a much flatter trend. And what that suggests is that one way to reduce damages is actually to think about what's in harm's way, right? What are we putting there that could be damaged? And can we manage that in some way to reduce risk and damages? We know, of course, that this is going to become harder and harder in the future. Um, here are projections of sea level rise for the United States through the end of the century. Um, so we're looking at uh, probably three plus feet of sea level rise based on more recent projections that seem to be um, gathering near the higher end of the range you can see here. So we have this trend of a global increase in damages, and we know that uh, this is likely to get worse, right? We've already seen wetter hurricanes. We've already seen more intense storms um, that are going to take place on higher sea levels and therefore cause more damage. So we're at a really interesting moment right now where I think uh, Governments at all levels, from local up to the federal government, are really reevaluating the way that we've managed these types of risks historically and whether that's going to work in a changing climate. 
So um, FEMA, along with many other branches of the federal government, are looking at their programs now um, to evaluate who they're really serving and the ways in which they might be actually exacerbating inequities um, that existed in, from their programs. Um, we have uh, a lot more money coming into this space than we've ever had before um, for infrastructure, for nature-based solutions, for all sorts of different responses. Uh, and we have a flood insurance program um, that has gone through um, sort of a, a little bit of a roller coaster <laughs> recently, but is currently going through basically the biggest revamp in its history, um, in its 50 year history, it's going through the biggest revamp um, right now. So one other way in which our kind of framing around managing climate risk is changing is that we're starting to talk about retreat in a really different way than we have before. Um, you know, decades ago, or maybe even less than decades ago, retreat was a really radical idea. I mean, it was um, something that people threw out there for these kind of ap apocalyptic scenarios. And over time, that has really, really shifted. Um, and the US National Climate Assessment, which is put out by um, the federal government every five-ish years, in the most recent one, they actually asserted that in all but the lowest sea level rise projections, retreat will become an unavoidable option in some areas along the US coastline. So this has gone from something that was uh, radical to something that's very mainstream. And you can see on the right here uh, what this could mean for Eastern North Carolina. Um, the areas in red are uh, land that's below the mean high tide line with six feet of sea level rise. Um, so retreat this idea that there are places where we might undevelop and move people and infrastructure purposefully away from those places um, could be uh, very, very meaningful to this state in particular. Uh, in the past, we have done retreat in the United States through a little bit of a uh, ad hoc program um, of floodplain buyouts. So floodplain buyouts are a program through which governments buy land, buy property, um, tear down houses and restore it to open space. So you can see uh, before and after here, this is a neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that street uh, on top, in the top half of the photo, right, almost all of those houses have been bought out and restored to open space. Um, it is a voluntary program. So the government offers to buy your house at what is supposed to be the um, market value. Um, and you can say no. Uh, so it's very much a, a property to property basis. Um, and as you can see, not everybody here has, um, has gone through the buyout yet. But we are investing more and more in um, actually returning land that was developed to an undeveloped state. So um, my thesis for today is that understanding exposure and in particular changes in exposure that are going to occur over time is really critical for adaptation policy. And it's really critical for this particular moment where we're doing this big reevaluation of the way that we do things. Um, on the left here are a series of pictures of the, the Myrtle Beach area over time. Um, and you can see, of course, that exposure has changed quite a bit over time. We started with really few permanent structures and mostly people just coming to the beach for the day and leaving. Um, and then in uh, panel B there, we've got uh, more permanent residences, largely bungalow, single story um, homes. And then of course, now we have mostly um, high rise condo buildings and hotels along that strip of the coastline. Um, and the policies and the infrastructure investments that you would make for a coastline that looks like picture A here, right, of course are gonna be really different than those in picture C. And we don't have a great understanding of really which direction we're going and moving forward. Because as you can see on the right, we have historically in the past 40 years seen a pretty steady increase in um, migration to coastal counties. Uh, so coastal shoreline counties in green there have increased in population density um, much faster 
than even coastal watershed counties, which are going to be a little bit farther inland and uh, the US overall. But people broadly anticipate that this is going to change in the future um, with climate change. And uh, we don't right now really factor in that thinking and those possibilities into the way that we're planning to adapt. Um, and because adaptations are by nature usually slow and take a, take a really long time to implement, um, it could mean we're actually planning adaptations for a community and a level of exposure that's not going to be there by the time that adaptation comes to fruition. So um, the work that I'm gonna be presenting today is really focused on this question of um, how has exposure changed before and how might it change in the future? So um, I will present kind of two chunks of work today. So I'm gonna start uh, with the motivating question of what is located in floodplain areas, um, a little bit more focus on the built environment in particular. And um, then I'll shift to the second question of who lives in flood prone areas. Um, and will do my best to demonstrate how I think uh, those two topics are closely linked and how we can use one um, to really get at two um, in a useful way. More specifically here under this topic of what is located in flood prone areas, um, I'll address these three sub questions. So how much development has occurred in North Carolina floodplains? Which communities have developed in safe versus flood prone areas? And are buyouts, those um, that buyout program I uh, mentioned earlier, are those effectively reducing exposure to flooding or not? So this question of how floodplain development has changed over time is not a new question. People have been working on this for a really long time. Uh, so this is a series, this is data from a series of studies dating back to 1936, um, where researchers were trying to track the number of floodplain structures in these different cities. And what was a major constraint for them at the time uh, was data. So um, for the most part, they were driving around and counting houses and looking at their map and trying to identify if that structure was in the floodplain or not. In some cases, they were uh, calling up the local planner and asking them to estimate the number of structures. And then right near the end, they actually got some uh, aerial photography that they could use and go in and count uh, where the houses were. And uh, fortunately for us, we, of course, live in a very different data environment uh, than was the case. And so what we do here is we take um, this, these rich data sets available to us and crunch them to get these really fine measures of floodplain development. So um, we have parcel and building records covering the state of North Carolina. We also have flood hazard maps. These are the ones produced by FEMA. Um, and we combine those so that for every parcel in the state, we can say, is there a building on it? And is it residential? Um, when was that building constructed? And is it in the floodplain or not? So first, some, I'll start with some state level results. Um, on the left here is the time series of floodplain construction in the state. Uh, and you can see that it, it uh, is clearly affected by uh, big economic cycles like the recession in the late 2000s. But on average, we're seeing about 2,700 new residences uh, built in the floodplain each year. And on the right uh, is the share in any given year of housing that's been built in the floodplain. Um, interestingly, that has ticked up a little bit over time. Uh, we're in the late 90s, we're in the 4% range. And more recently, we've actually gone up to building something like 6% of houses in the floodplain. I mentioned those property buyouts on um, and what effect that they have. North Carolina is actually a state that has done, I think the third most buyouts of any state in the US, uh, but we build much more than we remove. Um, so over this time period since 1995, We've built about 10 times as many houses in the floodplain as we've taken out. Um, and even in the, the year where we did the most buyouts, which was in the aftermath of Hurricane Floyd, 
um, we built three times as many new houses in that year as we removed. Um, and so uh, we certainly have not seen a net decrease um, in exposure thanks to buyouts, at least not at a state level. One of the things we want to do with this data is actually understand, you know, are there ways that communities have been able to grow in a safe way? Um, are there policies or programs that have allowed local governments to really channel their growth into safer areas relative to floodplains? So we wanna generate these measures at the community level and compare across the state to see if we can find some best practices. Um, and it's not immediately clear the best way to do that, right? Because for example, here are two different municipalities. So for us, a community is either a incorporated municipality or the unincorporated uh, parts of a county. Um, and here are two different communities. They have a similar number of new homes built in the floodplain over our time period. And so those are the parcels in blue. Um, but they're very different places, right? So first, um, they have very different levels of flood hazard. So the shaded blue here is the floodplain. Um, and in Rocky Mount, there's about 16% of, the, of its developable land that's in the floodplain, um, whereas for Oriental, it's much higher, right? It's 71%. And they're also growing at really different rates. So that 60-ish houses in Rocky Mount was about 3% of the total new housing built um, over the time period, whereas it's 60% in Oriental. So um, here in black are all of the other um, parcels that were uh, constructed for residential use over the time period. Um, and you can see just how much growth occurred uh, in Rocky Mount outside of the floodplain. So what we end up doing here is we uh, make Coco. <laughs> um, we put together plots that look like this. So on the x-axis, we've got the share of developable land in the floodplain, and in the y-axis, we have the share of new, of new housing on the in the floodplain. Um, so the way to think about this is if you're on this red dashed line, that's the one-to-one -one line. That's what you'd get if you essentially randomly scattered new housing across the community. Um, as you move up into the left, those are communities where um, floodplain development, we would say is disproportionately high, right? So we're talking about a community with a quarter of their land in the floodplain and three quarters of their uh, new housing in the floodplain. And then vice versa, as you go down and to the right. So what we're really concerned about here, right, are communities that are above this red line and uh, moving towards the uh, the top left corner. So uh, we run those numbers for every community in the state. And um, here each point is a community. They are orange circles if they're inland communities and they're purple triangles if they're coastal communities. And I've organized them here based on the median assessed property value um, in the community. So if you want to to think about what that means in market value, you would go, you would adjust up a little bit. Um, and these are also slightly older assessed values. Um, the interesting thing that we see here, so in the left two panels, um, you see kind of a scattering of communities that are above, um, above that dashed line where the, the levels of floodplain development are quite high. Um, on the right-hand panel, so these are communities with quite high um, property values. Uh, you can see lots of those purple triangles showing the coastal communities. And what's interesting is that in this wealthy tier, um, there are very few inland communities that are showing the high levels of floodplain development that we do see with inland communities in the other two panels. Um, and so our hypothesis here Right, or something that's indicated by this is um, this idea that on the left-hand side, um, we've got uh, communities where the floodplain is um, quite possibly the, the most affordable land to live in and build on. Um, and you have high, high levels of development there. Whereas here, these communities are really ones where um, proper uh, flood, flood risk is actually an amenity, right? It's uh, proximity to um, an environmental amenity, and that's risk that people are choosing to take on 
So we can look at this in, in another way, right? This hypothesis about wealth and uh, coast versus inland. Um, so in this plot, I've taken all of, um, all of the properties in inland communities, and I've organized them based on their property value in percentiles going from zero to 100. So 100 is the highest and zero is the lowest. And then in each of those percentiles, I said, how many of those residences are in the floodplain? And you can see here that we have this really strong U shape. Uh, and so if you're at this end where your options in terms of housing are quite small and um, in terms of what's affordable, your odds of actually ending up in a floodplain house are relatively high um, and they're lowest <laughs> in the middle. And then they peak again on the other side, right? So this is, I think, what we would think of as riverfront amenity, right? Attraction to the water in inland communities. And these are quite possibly places um, where uh, flood, flood risk is um, severe. It is not necessarily an amenity um, and it's the most affordable area to live in. If we do that exact same analysis for coastal communities, um, you see a, a fairly different plot. Um, first, the y-axis on these two are really, really different. Uh, so this is 80% and this is like 6%, um, but you absolutely see the coast as an amenity. Um, certainly uh, as uh, property values go up at the coast, your odds of being in the floodplain skyrocket. And so the vast majority of the, the homes of this tier are, are floodplain homes. Um, the last point I'll touch on with respect to floodplain development is this question of uh, buyouts at a community level. So our hypothesis here was that communities that have done buyouts, they're spending their own money on taking houses out of the floodplain. Um, so they're also less likely to have development in the floodplain, right? They've, they've recognized the risk, they're working to combat it. Uh, and we don't really see that. <laughs> Um, and so in particular with this group of communities where they've done uh, some buyouts, but not a huge number, there's a lot of places that are building a lot in floodplains, despite having uh, spent money removing homes from the floodplain. Um, and that's perhaps a little bit less true uh, over here, where the majority of the communities that have done a lot of buyouts are, um, are not seeing a lot of floodplain development. Um, but what we see here and, and in some additional analyses of um, in particular like federal incentives and policies and programs with respect to flood risk is the development trends really show almost no relationship to the level of effort that's going into flood risk management in other ways. Um, and so we have heard a lot from people that the emergency managers and floodplain managers that do buyouts have nothing to do with zoning, planning, and permitting. Um, and that seems to be true uh, based on uh, what we've seen so far. Okay, uh, so to sum up this section, you know, we build much more new housing and floodplains than we remove, which is perhaps not a surprise. Uh, wealth and that inland coastal divide are, are really important differentiating factor, factors there. Um, and buyout programs, they're getting bigger, they're expanding, I think, their footprint, but they're not leading to net reductions in exposure because we're not really addressing the supply side um, of who's in floodplains or what is in floodplains. Okay, so I'll shift now to this question, which I think is a harder question of who lives in floodprint print areas. Um, and here I'll um, focus primarily on this first question of buyout programs as a way of dislocating people from floodplains. Um, and so I'll ask who participates in buyout programs and where do they move to? Um, and so we know of course that there's kind of normal in and out migration of flood, from floodplains, um, but we do have a government program that is specifically moving very specific people out um, of their floodplain residences and um, their landing somewhere. Uh, so I'll look at that in particular. Um, and then just I'll touch on this question of uh, how new development might be affecting the composition of floodplain residents. And so, of course, we see lots of development that I just showed you in this first section. Um, and we're building for some particular types of people in particular places. Uh, and so how might those trends affect who is exposed to flooding? Uh, 
Um, so the buyout program has been quite widespread here. Um, all of these black dots are places that have done buyouts and the size of the dot shows um, the number of buyouts that have taken place there. So you can see, especially Eastern North Carolina with a lot of buyouts. Um, the program has existed for uh, over 30 years at this point, um, but we actually know very little about who is it, who it has affected and how. Um, and so I think originally it wasn't that widespread. Um, it was actually created in part to respond to the Mississippi River floods in the early 90s. Um, but more recently, a lot of concerns have been raised, um, particularly with respect to the idea that they uh, are disproportionately affecting um, low income and minority communities and acting as another force of dis another cause of displacement um, on top of sort of the normal stresses um, that are imposed on them. Uh, and so it has been hypothesized before that um, floods and flood risk can be sort of used as a way to uh, cause this type of displacement and um, we're exacerbating the uh, existing inequities through this program. Um, there's also been an opposite, I think, a hypothesis in the opposite direction about who this program might be affecting. And um, that line of thinking indicates that it would actually be the more advantaged wealthy people who participate in this program, because it is really, really hard to actually um, go through the buyout program and sell your house to the government, and it takes a really long time. Uh, and so on the left, you can see just a very, very um, reduced form of the process, but essentially um, you as the property owner have to go through your local government who goes to the state government who goes to FEMA, FEMA processes things and sends money back down. Um, and on average, it takes people more than five years from the time that they flood to the time that they sell their house. Um, and so the kind of opposite line of thinking around this program is that um, it's a way in which privileged homeowners can take advantage of a government program um, to potentially get more money for their house than they would otherwise. Uh, but you have to have um, uh, certainly the patience, the financial resources to endure something like this program for five years. Um, and just the sort of access and wherewithal to navigate such a complicated process to begin with. Um, so there's a lot of continuing debate over um, who is this program serving um, and is that a good thing? Because the other thing we don't really know is whether it actually leaves people better off. Um, and so if we think that it's a way to enable mobility for people who might not be able to move otherwise, um, perhaps that's a good thing. Uh, if it's a way for wealthy homeowners to take advantage of government resources, right, we would think about it differently. Um, so that's uh, the context in which we're looking at um, the particular buyouts in North Carolina, how they've evolved to date. Uh, so here you can see uh, where buyouts have taken place in North Carolina. As I mentioned, uh, there are more buyouts in North Carolina than most states in the US, almost all of them, but not quite. Um, and they've been uh, actually distributed across the state. So almost none of them have been really on the outer banks or directly on the coastline. Um, most of them have been in that coastal plain. Um, a number in Charlotte, as you can see here, Charlotte has a really uh, well-known robust buyout program, and then some in the Western part of the state as well. So, uh, the first thing we do here is we take the locations of these buyouts and their dates, because they've occurred um, dating back into the early 90s through to today. Um, and we look to see kind of what the what types of neighborhoods um, they took place in at the time. Um, and what we find, so on the left here is uh, the block groups of buyouts um, organized by percent minority. And on the right is, uh, again, block groups, but shown um, based on percent below the poverty line. Uh, and so you can see immediately that almost a quarter of buyouts have taken place in block groups that were 100% minority. Um, 
And there is a distribution. So there's also about a quarter um, that were in block groups of 20% or uh, less minority, but it's certainly uh, the case that there have been many buyouts in uh, predominantly minority neighborhoods. If we look at the distribution of um, people below the poverty line, you do still have quite a distribution. Um, there's a lot on this low end of relatively wealthy block groups, um, but then this long tail um, of uh, neighborhoods where 30% or more of the, the communities below the poverty line. Um, we, of course, don't see who the person is, right? Who the household is that's moving. So um, it could be the case that it's an 80% minority block group and it's um, not a minority household that's moving. Um, but even if it's not, right, buyouts are certainly a disruption to the neighborhood, um, right? Taking out a house and, and turning it into permanent open space. Um, and so we can see immediately that um, there certainly are, there certainly is a pattern here in, in which neighborhoods are going through this. Um, the next thing we did here is uh, track where participants, people who participate in the buyout program go. Um, and we do this through a data set of individual address histories that we've acquired from a credit bureau. Um, they compile it from a number of different records, including uh, banks and lenders, the postal service, um, real estate transaction records, and so forth. And uh, it uh, covers basically everyone who has shown up in any of those data sets. And so uh, who has been linked to a North Carolina address. So it's um, over 15 million adults across 42 million addresses, uh, including non-North Carolina addresses. So you can see one just example set of moves for one person on the left here, uh, where they moved in uh, 2004 down to Wilmington, they moved north in 2007 and again in 2019. Um, so we have the dates that uh, they were observed at the address um, and uh, it will capture both rental and own homes because it's any address they're linked to. Um, but a challenge with that is that it doesn't distinguish the full-time residents. And so if you're consistently linked to multiple addresses over time, um, then we have to do a little bit of guessing as to which one was the full-time home. So uh, what, we, what we did is we took our buyout addresses, we identified the people associated with that address, um, and we know about when the buyout happened. So we can identify the mover, the buyout mover, um, and then we track the buyout mover to their next address. Um, and we repeat the process of looking at the um, characteristics of the neighborhoods to which they move, right? Because again, we're um, constrained in kind of what we know about the individual versus uh, what we know about the place where they live and the place where they move to. So um, here I'm showing results um, using the term opportunity neighborhood. Uh, which I define here as a block group with lower than 25% poverty rate. Um, and uh, the housing scholars would tell you that, um, at least my understanding of what they would tell you, is that uh, the neighborhood poverty rate is a valuable indicator um, and can be associated with uh, social mobility in some instances. Um, so what we find is that uh, on average, we actually do see buyout households moving to uh, higher opportunity neighborhoods. And so on the left are the origins, about two thirds of buyout participants were already in opportunity neighborhoods um, and about a third weren't. So they were in places with higher poverty rates. Um, and of those that were in that third um, more than half moved into a neighborhood with a lower poverty rate. Um, we do see a group um, moving in the opposite direction, but we see more people moving um, into an opportunity neighborhood than out of it. Um, and of course, we also see a group of people kind of staying put, um, relatively speaking. Um, when you look at some of the distinguishing factors between those two groups. Uh, one that jumps out is how far they're going, 
Um, so of the people we observed who went from a non-opportunity to an opportunity neighborhood, uh, the average distance moved was about 20 miles compared to about five miles in the other group. Um, and you can see that just with this kind of long tail of, of records that we have going out farther, you can also see it if you just look at it on a map. Um, so here I've mapped the origins, the buyout locations in red and in blue are the places where they went. So with the opportunity movers, you see uh, a number of people moving into the triangle, um, also the triad and the Charlotte. Um, and if you compare that map to the non-opportunity movers, you see um, a very little movement into the triangle, none into the triad, and no one's actually moving into Charlotte. Um, you have basically people moving within Charlotte. Um, and so it's certainly clear here that um, the types of moves that are being made are quite different. Um, and I think one question that remains for us is the extent to which these people who are moving short distances are doing that out of choice and out of um, preferring to uh, maintain connected to the neighborhoods that they were in before um, versus financial constraints, for instance, that are uh, actually preventing them from making the moves we tend to see here, uh, which are much longer distances, but also seem to be correlated with uh, moving into a neighborhood um, with lower poverty rates. Um, so while we can't tell, for instance, at this point, um, did the people who made these moves into different neighborhoods actually end up better off? Um, it's clear that there might be situations here um, where people would be interested in making a longer move and weren't able to because the way the bio program is currently constructed, there's really no assistance for actually moving. Um, you just get a check for whatever your property was worth and uh, that's about it. So there may be opportunity here from a policy perspective to actually leave people better off than they were before. Um, and my last point on um, this question about, uh, the second question about how floodplain development affects the composition of people. Um, this is, I think, um, I, I, preliminary is, I guess, the right word, less than preliminary is maybe the better word. Um, but if you look at, um, for instance, these two areas of Newburn, um, the purple circle here on the left is, um, the historical center. So uh, the original area that was developed highly flood prone, it's at the influence of the confluence of two rivers and also is affected by storm surge. Um, this green circle is a newer development, also highly flood prone. It only has one road in and out. So it causes a lot of headaches for emergency managers. Um, and using that same data set that I described previously, what we can do is look at who is moving into these places. So if we take the current residents, the best we can understand it, of the people living in the purple circle versus the people living in the green circle and say, where did they move from? Right Before we even look at the uh, demographics and socioeconomic characteristics of the neighborhoods they came from, um, we can see immediately that they're catering to different uh, sets of um, movers, right? So in the historical center, um, the vast majority of people moved less than five miles um, to their current uh, residence. That's the tall purple line um, here. Uh, whereas in the green circle, which is a much more recent development, we see a lot of people who are making longer distance moves. Um, hundreds of miles to end up in this particular location um, compared to people that are moving to the historical center. Um, and of course, that's for lots of reasons. And we can um, look into uh, age and property values and um, all sorts of other ways to get at this. But the idea here is that we're building for some types of people. Uh, and if that's true, then in the long term, the people that we're building for right, are going to increasingly represent the population that's exposed. And that in turn might influence the policies and the actions that we would choose to take. Okay, um, so to wrap up with this section, 
we find that buyouts have affected a lot of minority and low-income neighborhoods in North Carolina, though not exclusively those neighborhoods. Um, based on where people are moving, buyouts can be a positive move in some respects, at least from what we can observe uh, from here. But there's potentially an opportunity for additional resources to help households in this program and through this process. Um, and you know, we are starting to see that new floodplain development is shifting the composition of floodplain residents. Um, and those types of changes would likely uh, influence the adaptation policies and practices that would uh, make sense and that would be beneficial. And I will close there and I'm happy to take your questions. Great, thank you, Miyuki. I guess we don't clap in the Zoom seminar. I don't know, <laughs> feels weird. We should clap, it was good. That was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, do you wanna say something? Uh, well, maybe we should go back to um, not screen sharing and we can see each other. Um, and we should definitely have some clapping at some point. And I have questions, but I'm gonna let other people go if they want to. Well, I think you should go first, actually, since you're the director, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, and then right. I'll just go in the order on my screen. Okay, sounds good. Um, so that was really fascinating. And I've got several questions. Um, so one, you know, as, as we're looking at the percentage of residences built in the floodplains are going up over time. Can you sort of decompose that into how much of that is new residences in an original floodplain versus the floodplain itself changing? So that's one thing that I was sort of wondering about. And then I'll give you one more, um, which is kind of like a demography question in a way. I mean, I found myself wondering if you could generate from the transunion data, almost kind of like stylized life cycle patterns of people moving from, you know, their first home to a higher value home and also sort of changes in risk accompanying that. And I also wondered about sort of like the age of the buyout group. I mean, are these old people selling their homes or young people? So that it seems like sort of putting some of the demography into the, um, movements related to changing risk seems really interesting. And I know that's a tall order in some ways, but um, but I'm just curious about the potential. Mm -hmm. um, those are great questions. So for the first one, we use a static floodplain, um, meaning we use the floodplains that are identified right now. And those um, likely have changed over time, though not necessarily in the direction you'd expect, right? Since we have seen floodplains get smaller or the, the regulatory floodplains get smaller in North Carolina in particular. Um, so it is not that the floodplains are getting bigger, um, but that we're putting more stuff in the place that's designated that way. However, so to complicate this a little bit further, it's possible that the local governments are regulating, well, they're regulating based on what's in the maps. So they may have not really cared, so to speak, about development that is now in the floodplain because the map has changed. Right, so we only map what's uh, currently considered the floodplain, but since that's changed over time, it, we might be catching stuff that wasn't in the floodplain when it was currently built. Um, though the reverse is also possible that we're, um, that stuff was in the floodplain when it was built, it's not now and we're not counting it. Um, to your second question, yes. I, so I think there's, um, we're just starting to get into this data, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to I mean, frankly, like do these broad descriptive analyses that would still be really valuable, even if they're not linked to flooding or to buyouts or any particular climatic uh, stressor. Um, I'm really interested, like I think that comparing retired people who potentially are less bound to a specific location, right, to um, younger households that are maybe more job, like more concerned about commutes and schools, um, 
is one like major uh, differentiating factor where we might see more sensitivity among the older or more responsiveness among retired groups. Um, and we do have age, so we can actually say um, how the ages of people in places are changing over time or when people moved with, with respect to their age. Um, for buyouts in particular, I don't think I have looked at the ages that we find, but um, in general, we actually find that it tends to be, I would say, middle-aged to younger households that are participating. Um, what you often hear is with older households, the person will say, I just want to live here. I just don't want, like, it's just too much to ask me to move at this point. And in some cases, um, governments are exploring having agreements with them to sell to the government when they pass away, um, because they're totally fine with that as the next, um, as the outcome for the property, they just don't want to move right now. So my hunch is that it's a little bit in the younger um, demographic, but I actually, I, we can check and I haven't checked. Thanks. Great. Um, I see Cassandra in the chat. Do you want to uh, visualize? <laughs> Hi, Miyuki. I'm, I'm so I'm so thankful to be able to hear your presentation. I feel like we work on projects and just to hear you talk about what you're really passionate about, I'm grateful for. Um, so my question, you know my perspective and how I like to to look at the the outliers or, or the the invisible people. Um, like we know from from past storms or past events that low income households typically, um, they, they stay in the same area because their family, their community is connected. And we also know that they, they will sometimes or oftentimes will, will move in with another family member. Um, within your data, how, were you able to see, I guess two questions, were you able to see the extent that house, households merged? Like maybe that at one point you had a household that was only getting mail from the Williams, but then, you know, after some change in time, you now have Williams, Richards, Jones are all coming to one household. Um, and secondly, also thinking about those who are like homeless, right? Like, were you able to, does your data count the number of people that have changed within a household? Like, do you, do you have those, that number? And are you, are you able to kind of look at the differences um, like before and after an event, if those numbers jump, um, regardless if they're actually receiving mail? So I just gave you like a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah, well, but I think um, in particular dealing with these uh, kind of large scale administrative data sets where the data generating process is not super clear, right? It is like, I think exactly the questions you're asking, asking are really important. Um, so the short answer is um, to the first question is yes, we do observe when multiple people live in the same household. Um, so because we have the date first and last seen, um, you know, if you show up at someone else's house during the time that we're pretty sure they're living there, um, then the assumption is that you have moved in with them. Um, and we do have names. So if you have the same last name, um, for example, younger people, we only, they only enter the data set at 18. So we often see like a 20 year old person who has just added just joined that address, right? Um, so uh, we can observe that. I think, um, you know, that's something that we should look at with our buyouts, like the, the number of people that we think are actually moving in to a new property on their own versus ones that are moving in with family. Um, since we know that's a time of stress, like a time of major duress. Um, and um, yeah, so we should be able to observe that. I think we definitely don't observe some people. Um, and so uh, the people who are really well documented in this data set are particularly ones who interact a lot with the financial system. And uh, so we know for sure that uh, some people are not going to be captured in that or not as well anyway. 
Um, and we also do have instances where, um, and again, <laughs> Like, I don't know necessarily that we'll be able to figure out what's going on. We have instances where people just sort of disappear. Like the, it's their last, we have some of the people in the buyout data set where the buyout address was their last known address um, and they don't reappear. Um, and so we have hypothesized about that. Like it could be that if they move in with a family member, they never bother to update some of the, you know, like they don't file a a change of address with the postal service, right? If it's a elderly person and their kids are doing a lot of the administrative stuff for them at that point. Um, but what we haven't done yet is just looked at like, where do we have a lot of those people? And is that correlated with other things we know about those places? And I think that would help us a lot. Thank you. Miyuki, what is UNC IRB thinking about you having everyone's <laughs> names and addresses for like 50 million people or whatever it is? They know about it, I promise. <laughs> um, Did they ask for special protections or anything? So the Credit Bureau has a data use agreement. So we um, are certainly abiding by that. Um, it was surprising to me the extent to which the credit bureau does not have an IRB and therefore doesn't really have protocols for, um, for thinking about uh, protecting human subjects. Um, so we, yeah, it's very much password protected and not on any of our local computers. Um, what's interesting is the next thing that we're planning to do with this data set that I'm like woefully behind on is um, because it's a credit bureau, they have a lot of financial attributes. Um, they, they're the people that put together your credit score. So all of the banks and lenders are reporting like this was the mortgage and they're paying it on time and they have medical debt and so forth. And um, so they will, they won't give that to us at uh, identified with a name, obviously. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, and what we're going to go through with IRB is, you know, we'll join, uh, we'll take our data and join information about the locations. So information about were they in a floodplain? Did they flood during Florence? Um, do we know if they were living in a single family home or a mobile home? Um, the census related characteristics. And then we can essentially send them that data where they then join the credit data and strip out the individual, like the name and the address specifically. Um, and so that process, I, uh, I think um, will require a lot of back and forth on our end with IRB, not to satisfy their security requirements, but to really ensure that we're actually doing enough to protect people's identities um, because it, yeah, it was surprising to me, um, their willingness to share the data. Well, you're in a completely different world than we're used to living in, right? Where, you know, usually the data providers, uh, from the feds or whatever, very concerned about these issues and wow. Yeah. Well, that's um, interesting. at the same time, I was going through a process trying to get a data set from HUD and, uh, you know, like six six or seven of us got notarized affidavits signed and all of this stuff. And then um, three weeks later, they were like, oh, we don't actually have that data. We can't give it to you. <laughs> so it, it was truly um, a bizarre, yeah, really bizarre differences. Great. Um, I see Fanaba's uh, hand up. Hi, yes. I have a quick question. You may have said this in the in the talk, but I was trying to follow. So uh, I was I was intrigued by the when you said that the program took five years on average for people to complete the buyout. And so I saw that, you know, later on in the talk, most of the people were in opportunity zones and moved to opportunity zones. So I was wondering, you know, if your house, you know, experience a weather event during those five years, you know, there, there might be some, some selection going on there, right? So it's selecting on people that um, 
are less likely to experience a weather event or am I, am I thinking about this right <laughs> due to the length of the program? I was just wondering if like how you guys are thinking about that and, and also if you have any insights as to why it takes so long for, um, for the program to, to com be completed. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it's um, the, to the latter and the short answer, it's, it's, it's like a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, it takes, uh, so, you know, the process in details, the local government first has to decide that they're going to participate in this program and even make it available to residents. And then they go and solicit applications. So they, you know, will go door to door and say, do you want to do this? And then if you say yes, then they have to get, you know, dozens of property level assessments of like, do you have, uh, do you have any hazardous materials on the property? Um, do you have a clean deed? Do you have um, like what insurance coverage have you had? You know, who's paid for what damages and so forth. So they put all of that together um, and then they pass that to the state. The state collects them from all the communities in the state and then passes them up to FEMA. So that process in itself, like it often is years before FEMA has even approved the project, like after the flood. And then the money has to come back down. And um, even in the best of times, it's not super easy to sell. To, you can't sell a house instantaneously. And so um, if you imagine, uh, and local governments have to provide a match, which means they're a little bit cost constrained as well in that they have to provide money up front. And if they don't have it all at that moment, they stagger them. So they're like, well, we only have the money to buy five properties in this year. And hopefully in next year, we'll have money to do three more. Um, and so all of that adds up to a really long time. What that means for selection um, is complicated. So you do, I absolutely have heard of people who flood multiple times while they're waiting for the buyout to occur, um, which is awful. Uh, and I think causes a lot of attrition from the program. And so most times these people can sell to just someone who's gonna flip the house and sell it to someone else. Um, not all the time, depending on where you are, but um, you certainly hear post flood, people will come in and just offer to pay you cash for your damaged house. And so people do drop out and sell. Um, and so I am, who stays in, I think a lot, people have generally thought that it's people who kind of have the financial resources to um, withstand some of those shocks over time until they do sell. Um, and potentially they buy, even might have the financial resources to buy another place before they've sold. So they move, right? And then it's just a vacant property waiting for it to complete the process. Um, and so I do think it, I, that seems quite likely to me. I do think it's actually the most flood prone homes because um, you'll hear people talk about that they don't wanna pass on this problem to another family. And that's why they're doing this and selling it to the government instead of selling to someone else. So I think it's very flood prone properties, but probably people who have a little bit of a cushion financially who can cope with this very long process. Thank you, yeah, great. So we're at, um, we're at one o'clock. So we certainly understand that people need to go. Miyuki said she would be able to hang around for a little while. So um, let's take some more questions. Just put your hand up. Paul? Paul Leslie? I think he's applauding. Oh, he's applauding. Oh, sorry, that's not sorry the about that. I was, sorry, Paul. I was trying to applaud. Good job, Yuki. Good to hear from you. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. My, my bad on the icon recognition. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? Um, okay. How about the, um, how about this, Miyuki? Um, I'm wondering if new structures that are built in floodplains might have additional protection, such as elevation of the structure that might make them less vulnerable than, than old structures. I certainly see that on the coast. And even in Durham, I see some 
houses built adjacent to uh, creeks and stuff where like the back part of the house is elevated instead of having a, a basement. Yeah, um, we do a, uh, a long uh, tangential analysis into the elevations of homes. We have a little bit of, we have some information about the first floor elevations from data the state collected a long time ago or in, starting in 2010 is when they collected it. And so we have looked specifically at changes in the first floor elevations over time of floodplain structures and um, geographic trends. So we find that the oceanfront communities, there's a really, really steep increase in the elevation, first floor elevations for sure. So like those new properties are definitely lower risk than the old ones um, in the oceanfront communities. But in most of our uh, farther inland communities or even just not wave exposed, so uh, inner banks, I guess you would say communities, the trend line's really flat. Um, and so we, do, we don't see like, we don't see much trend at all for the most part, except for um, the islands essentially and some of the the communities right on the edge there. Um, but it's it's certainly true that I would say most new builds contribute less to risk, right? Like they're less likely to be damaged. Um, but the exposure question, um, it's a, I guess you have concerns about risk and you have concerns about exposure. Right, and sometimes they're different, right? So um, there's a, there's some reason to be concerned about exposure as well. Yeah, I see that driving to the coast, uh, right before you get to the sound, there'll be these giant houses right on the water that are not really elevated and you have to assume those are really, really high risk. Yeah, and there's requirements if you're in the floodplain for a minimum elevation standard and some counties really recently in North Carolina counties have pushed those up. Um, so there will be a higher standard for new homes starting from now. Um, but that also makes it a little bit hard for us to tell are they just building to code or are they building higher because they actually were concerned about the risk and wanted to build higher. Um, I think it's a lot of things going on there. Yeah. How, how good are the FEMA maps considered to be um, relative to, you know, what, what might actually happen? Um, not good. <laughs> well, okay, so that's not fair. <laughs> um, that was my impression, yeah. Uh, so my understanding um, is that the FEMA models for the risks that they actually model, which are storm surge and rivers and streams, um, are not all that bad, but they explicitly don't model like rainfall, for instance. So like urban flash floods are explicitly not modeled. So they're of course wrong in those places, right? Where the, the risk is from that type of flooding. Um, and they're trying to work on that. And then they're also, they also tend to be old because FEMA doesn't have the money to update them all that much. So in places that are developing really quickly or in places where there's new infrastructure, they're also very likely to be wrong um, because they don't capture any dynamic, dynamic changes. But they have this regulatory power um, no matter what, right? So lots of communities just just care about the regulatory floodplain, regardless of its accuracy. Um, so while I would say what we find is not doesn't really speak to risk because the floodplain maps could be wrong and because the houses could be higher or lower, um, I think it's a better reflection of like what communities are actually trying to do and actually caring about because the zone that they care about, they don't have any other maps. They have, they've got their FEMA map. Um, and so from a policy perspective, they're really relevant even if they're bad. Sure. Great. Well, that was incredibly informative hour of time. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Elizabeth? Good job. That was great. No, that was terrific.
we'll continue the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what is the status of DEET? 